your hymn book and turn to hymn number 268. Hymn 268, let's stand together and sing. Look and live. John Marcello, will you pray for us, please? Never trusted in it. 
can be seated this morning. We do want to welcome you to Tri-State Baptist Temple uh, today, and we are excited that you're here, and we're looking forward to uh, just another good day in the Lord's house. We had a great week last week, and uh, we're thankful for all that we did, and, uh, but we're glad to be back today and just looking forward to hearing 
uh, from the Word of God today and, and uh, being here together. We have several announcements we want to make and uh, remind you about today. Uh, don't forget about uh, our Valentine's dinner uh, this year. It's going to be on February the 6th, and we're looking forward to that, and we hope you'll come and be a part of it. And uh, the theme is Red Carpet Romance, and Pastor always just does a great job and has a lot of fun things that we do. We'll enjoy a good meal together and have a good time. And uh, there is a sign-up sheet, and we'll send that around. If you're planning on coming, we'd like you to sign up so we can be well-prepared and uh, make sure we have uh, all that we need. And But we want you to come and be a part of that. Uh, this week... Uh, our church is hosting uh, the Tri-State Pastors Fellowship, and that's a, a time where uh, local pastors get together and just uh, have uh, some fellowship together. There'll be some preachers that preach uh, for them and uh, for those kind of things. We, we're hosting that this month, uh, uh, this week actually, on Thursday, and one of the things that always happens at the Pastors Fellowship is there's a lunch, and uh, you can help us with that, and we're going to send a sign-up sheet around for that as well, and I want to explain it to you so you you know, uh, I'm dropping everything, so you know uh, what we're doing, uh, but we're going to have, there's a place to sign up for chicken or barbecue, and in that section, uh, we're asking you just to uh, give a monetary donation for those items, uh, because we want to go and, and just pick those up together uh, at one time, so we have all the same thing and have enough, those kind of things, and if you would like to give uh, towards that, you can sign up for that and, and put what you're giving on there, and that'll be a blessing to us. Then there's also some places uh, on here for the rest of the menu uh, where you can sign up for items you actually bring in, and so uh, we have things like roll that can be used for to make sandwiches, barbecue sandwiches, and those kind of things, coleslaw, baked beans, uh, uh, some other things. You could bring some desserts, and if you'd like to sign up to bring those items, uh, you could do that for us as well. Uh, or if you'd just like to give a monetary donation towards it and you don't want to think about all those things and uh, just want to give towards that, you can sign up for that. And uh, this is this week, and so uh, uh, this is important. We get this taken care of today so we can have a good uh, uh, meal for those pastors that will be here on Thursday this week. So we're looking forward to that, and, and you can help us with that as well. And if you have any questions about it, just ask us, and we'll help you uh, with that as well. We're looking forward to it. Uh, we've also got a sign-up sheet uh, for our first growth group activity that we're going to have this year. We were excited about that, uh, mentioning that last uh, at the, our vision night, and uh, one of the new things we're going to do this year And our first growth group activity is for families with teenagers, for families with teenagers, and uh, that event is going to be next Sunday night after the service, and we're going to have, we're going to have a super Sunday, and uh, it's the Super Bowl Sunday, so we're going to get together, uh, these families with teenagers, and uh, after church, and have some snacks, some refreshments, and uh, we'll turn on the football game and watch that, enjoy some time together. And so we want to encourage our families with teenagers to be a part of this first growth group activity and come and be a part of that uh, next Sunday. But we're asking you to sign up for that as well just so we can be well prepared. And uh, uh, so we'll send that around. And uh, let's see what else I got. I got other things. We, our Bible building hour is starting in March and that's going to be what we re, uh, are doing uh, in, the, uh, in what we now have is the Sunday school hour. And Pastor explained that last week as well. We want you to sign up and register for, to be a part of those things. And uh, so lots of things that are going on. I want to make sure I've got them all. Uh, got them all here that you can, uh, we've talked about. And uh, our King's Court, continue to pray for that. I had a couple of more register yesterday and uh, that's I can't get any more because we've got to get our uniforms order and uh, Drew won't have much time to get them all done and so that, that I think that's all we're going to get but we have a, a, around 80 participants and uh, uh, it's going to be uh, just a just a blessing and uh, it'll be busy in that gym and that's exciting and uh, we're looking forward to it uh, all that we get to uh, be a part of and we'll still need your help and we're we're practicing every Saturday and the second Saturday of February we'll begin to have our actual games and on game days we have a full concession stand and and uh, just have a great time so we could use your help in the kitchen and helping greet people as they come in one of the things that we'll really need help with this year is just helping people find uh, a place to sit uh, you know I know how I am and I know how you are we go in a place and we don't want to sit right next to somebody we want to kind of spread out 
and uh, we'll have to help people learn to get comfortable and scoot in a little bit so we can get everybody in to watch the games. But uh, it's, it's good, and it's a lot of fun. And uh, so we want to encourage you to be praying for it and help us as well. And uh, there's lots of other things going on that we want you to be praying for be a part of. But uh, we're thankful for all these things. Oh, for our, uh, for our teenagers as well, we're having a, an activity tomorrow. And uh, you, so you parents know that as well. Uh, we're going to go to spare time and go bowling tomorrow. Uh, we're going to leave here at 6 o'clock, and uh, we're looking forward to that as well. And, and teenagers know about it, so I want you parents to know about it too and uh, be a part of that. So just a time of fellowship as well, but we're looking forward to it. So lots of things going on in our church, but we're thankful for it and excited about it, and we're glad that you're a part uh, of all these things as well. But we'll ask our men to come now, and we'll take up our tithes offering, faith promise missions offering. Amen. Let's pray together again this morning. Amen. Good morning. It's a joy to see everybody today. We appreciate you coming out and being here on the last Sunday in January. That's hard to believe, isn't it? We've already moved through one month in the year, and uh, we're moving right on into February, and it looks like a beautiful spring day out there. And how many of you have already seen the robins out in your yard? They're all over our yard here. That's, that's unusual, isn't it? That's odd. Uh, but they're all around already and uh, all kinds of things like that. But these days make you want spring to come even sooner. But I know we'll probably still have some winter weather to go through too. But it sure is a blessing to have uh, a, a beautiful day like today. And it's a joy to have you here uh, as well in our services. Just uh, wonderful. And it's a blessing to see you. Thank you for coming out. I hope everybody got a copy of your church bulletin. And Evan went through many of the things that are going on. And and uh, we had a great vision night last, uh, last Sunday night and uh, got to share uh, much of the vision of, uh, of the Lord for our church, for the year, for your families. I appreciate people who came out for that. And uh, it meant a lot to me just to have you here and uh, to be able to share those things with you. And so uh, it was a blessing. And uh, if you, uh, if you uh, reserved a church calendar and maybe weren't here uh, or whatever the situation might have been that you couldn't come, uh, those resources and the things that we made available for last Sunday night are most of them in the room that you see where the door is open right there. There's two tables there. Uh, your calendars are there. If you reserve one, uh, your name will be on the back on a little label in the corner, and you can go and pick it up. And it has uh, almost uh, every event and activity of the year in there for you. Uh, every day of the year has a scripture memory ver or scripture verses on it portion of the Bible, so if you read all those, you've read through the Bible in a year, and uh, all those resources are there available for you, all kinds of booklets back there for you to get and to read that will help you spiritually in your own life and in your home, and uh, we've written these and printed them up and have you for you, there's a variety of them back there, I hope everybody will at least go back and walk through the room before you leave and see if there's something in there you think the Lord could use in your life. doesn't matter whether you're a member of the church or not. Uh, if you know the Lord as your Savior or not, uh, there's things back there I think can help you and be a blessing to your life. There are ways for you to get connected or to be involved uh, uh, for uh, various things, uh, birthdays and anniversaries. If you want to be on our list, uh, there's a card back there you can fill out. Just drop it in the basket. If you want to be enrolled in our church cast information system, fill out the card, drop it in the basket, and uh, this will help us to get all those things updated and, 
and where they ought to be. I hope everybody will take one of what we called our refrigerator cards, and there's some right here. They have on it our church theme for the year, which is being a New Testament church in the last days, and I hope you'll pray about that and pray throughout the year that we'll uh, just desire to seek and to be and to stand on what uh, the New Testament example of a church is, and uh, we need it for our lives, and it will make a difference in our communities. So uh, take one of the cards, put it up somewhere where you'll see it often, and uh, pray about uh, those things. And uh, so be sure to go back and visit that resource room after the service today and uh, pick up so, some of the things, anything you'd like, and uh, you can use it. There's also places for you to uh, register or to sign up to volunteer in ministry or in service or to involve yourself in activities and events. Uh, if you'd like to be a part of the ladies' uh, prayer group or the ladies' Bible study or go on the men's retreat or whatever it might be, uh, you can find that appropriate uh, list and you can put your name on it and then we'll be praying for you and be giving you more information as we move toward those events and uh, all these things uh, are there in that room. So we hope you'll just make the most out of it. But we're glad you're here. Thank you for coming and being a part of today's services and we're looking forward to all the events that uh, Evan mentioned. The Pastors Fellowship is a group of uh, local pastors in the tri-state just like me who who try to meet once a year, uh, once a month through the school calendar year, sort of. Uh, we don't meet in the summertime because of all the extra activities and events, but it's hosted by a local church once a month, and we gather together as preachers and pastors to encourage each other and to preach to one another. And, uh, and uh, you know, it's good for preachers to get preached at by preachers who are going, uh, who are experiencing what they do and walking in their shoes. And so... The Lord can use them to meet needs in our lives. And we're hosting that Thursday morning. It's at 10 a.m. There'll be 15 or 20 preachers here. But we'd really like to show them we appreciate what they do. And uh, we appreciate men of God throughout the tri-state that are pastoring churches just like our church and ministering to families just like yours. And uh, where would we be without uh, good Bible-preaching churches and pastors? And and so they're, they're an important people in our community, and we want to honor them. I want to give them a great lunch, and, uh, and they love to eat. Pastors, you know, many preachers and pastors, they don't do a lot of other things, but they like eating, you know. Eating's a hobby, and uh, so, so they do, and we want to be a blessing to them. So check that little list out. If you want to give a monetary donation just to help with some of the food items, do it. Evan mentioned that. Uh, we're going to just buy the chicken and buy some barbecue so they can have either one. We'll just buy that, but if you'd like to give toward helping purchase that, you can. Uh, but the other dishes, uh, bringing in the rolls or making a pot of baked beans or uh, bringing in some coleslaw or uh, potato wedges is what we had on that list. Uh, you can buy those bagged, frozen, and warm them up and bring them in. If you'd like to help and do that, do it and try to have that in here by uh, 11 o'clock or so on Thursday morning in the ministry center or if you just want to give a donation and we'll try to pick it up and do what we can to get it ready that would be a blessing but we want to be a church that just is a good host and and we don't I don't do it often I, I probably haven't hosted the fellowship in two or three years here so it's not something we're trying to ask you to do often but we would love you to just be a blessing in that way and we thank you for it and uh, it'll be a blessing to have our men here but uh, we're glad you're here thank you for coming out and and uh, we said that January and February are months that we're going to focus on uh, just resetting some things in our relationship with Jesus Christ. We said that we all, if we're honest, you know, last year as we started a brand new year, no doubt we, we said there were things in our life a year ago that we'd like to iron out some wrinkles in and we'd like to, uh, to get straight uh, and, to, and to do better with in our relationship with the Lord, in serving God, in living for Him. And a year has passed. And, uh, and we find ourselves at the beginning of another year. And if we're honest, we look back over last year and we just never really got some of those things done. And sometimes there's times in life when we need to just push the reset button. You know, the Bible says the psalmist cried out, Create in me a clean heart, O Lord. And what did he say? He said, push the reset. Renew in me a right spirit, O God. And so that's what we're thinking about. 
And so we're looking at some things in our life here in January and February that sometimes we just need to reset. We, re we, th we thought about that very thought, about resetting our relationship with Jesus Christ. Last Sunday morning, we talked about resetting our race for Jesus Christ. We looked uh, in the Word of God in Hebrews, and, and the Bible said there that, uh, that we're to run the race that is laid before us with patience, laying aside the sin and the weights that thus so easily beset us. And so we have a race to run. And sometimes we need to get back in that race, or we need to start racing again effectively for the Lord. And today I want you to take your Bibles and turn to Matthew chapter 4, the Gospel of Matthew chapter 4. And uh, we're going to look at the idea of resetting your purpose, resetting your purpose. And uh, Matthew 4, we'll begin to read in verse 17. I'm looking forward to tonight as well. I hope everyone will be in attendance this evening. And uh, we're going to be uh, looking at another thought uh, of a series of messages we'll be preaching here early uh, in this new year. And we've entitled that series of messages, But Continue Thou in the Things Thou Hast Learned. Continue Thou in the Things Thou Hast Learned. And tonight we're going to look at the idea of continue, continue in godly relationships in your life. All the relationships of your life, they should be God-centered. And we're going to look at those tonight. We're going to look at the home a lot primarily and in, uh, in, in our relationships as as within that home as well uh, as in other areas of life. But we want to continue having a God-centered relationships. And, uh, and so we hope you'll be back tonight, 6 o'clock, and we'll look at that. Matthew chapter 4 today, and uh, I hope you'll take your Bible and follow right along in God's Word. And uh, we want you to see that what we're preaching today is right here for you. It's, a, it's God's Word. It's not, it's not our opinions or attitudes or... Uh, or our ideas, but we find these truths right here in the Bible. Matthew 4, verse 17. From that time, Jesus began to preach and to say, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And Jesus, walking by the Sea of Galilee, saw two brethren, Simon called Peter and Andrew his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishers. And he saith unto them, Follow me. And I will make you fishers of men. And they straightway left their nets and followed him. And going on from thence, he saw other two brethren, James the son of Zebedee, and John his brother in a ship, and Zebedee their father mending their nets, and he called them. And they immediately left the ship and their father and followed him. And we'll stop right there, but I want us to think today about resetting, resetting our purpose reset your purpose and uh, I hope you'll uh, you'll look today with me into God's word and we'll open up our hearts to what we find there father we thank you for the day we thank you for your goodness and grace Lord we pray for those today who uh, Lord are going through trials and and uh, difficult times and Lord uh, we know that there are some God as we've seen over the past few weeks Lord who who have uh, who have suffered Lord through uh, the separation of loved ones who have have uh, who've moved ahead and and Lord they uh, their their race Lord has has moved now into a different place and so we just we just look to you to give them grace and comfort them and strengthen them and Lord we pray that that we'll always be looking to you to receive from you your love and grace and help and strength and Lord we know that uh, Lord today that uh, God we need uh, we need your word today and Lord we need it more than physical food and and anything else that we might have, it is, uh, it is uh, that which will uh, help us to grow and will strengthen us spiritually, strengthening the inner man. And Lord, we know your grace is sufficient to help us at all times. And so, Lord, may we just open up our hearts to the word of God today. May we be people who desire to be biblical, to, to have a relationship with you, Lord, that is what you desire it to be. And Lord, one in which we'll know your blessings and God will see uh, your hand upon our lives and homes and families and marriages and children. And so, Lord, we just pray today that you'll help us to consider the reset that we may need with our purpose. And, uh, Lord, we'll just ask you to, uh, to do what only you can do in this service. Lord, we believe there could be some people today sitting in church who need to just simply trust you as their Savior. Lord, they, they're sinners, as we all are. We're all sinners. We, we know that sin has separated us from you. 
And Lord, we know that you sent your son to pay the price for sin. And that debt is so, uh, so great that we cannot repay it. And Lord, we need to trust you as our personal Savior. And so Lord, today we pray that you'll speak to hearts. Uh, we'll all be obedient. If we need to trust you and be saved, that those uh, that need to be will be. Uh, and Lord, we pray that for us that know you as our Savior, we'll be obedient to you. And that we'll ask it in Jesus' name we pray. And amen. And amen. Howard, Howard Schultz is the chairman of uh, the board of Starbucks. And he also uh, was a former owner of an NBA basketball team, the Seattle Supersonics. He made this statement. He said, when you're surrounded by people who share a passionate commitment around a common purpose, anything is possible. Anything is possible. Nitschke who was a German philosopher, he said, to forget one's purpose is the commonest form of stupidity. To forget one's purpose is the commonest form of stupidity. Benjamin Disraeli was a two-time prime minister of Great Britain. He said, the secret of success is constancy to purpose. Constancy to purpose. You know, it is a fact recognized even in the world apart from the Bible, not even speaking about the Bible, but it is, a, it is a, a fact recognized in the world that having a purpose for who we are and what we do is essential to success. Success re rarely happens accidentally. Uh, success rarely happens uh, randomly. Uh, people who are successful people are people that have purpose. They have a purpose for who they are and what they're doing. And even the world recognizes that. You know, yet today there are many people who are living without a sense of or an awareness of purpose. And many of them are, are God's people. They're, they're among the people of God. There are people who are living their lives day in and day out. They're going here, there, and, and doing this, that, and the other thing, but it is without true purpose in the activity of their lives. They're alive and they're active, but their lives lack purpose. You know, secular hu humanists have a philosophy of the purpose of man. The world that we live in, the prevailing philosophy of the world today, has a, a thought about man's purpose. Uh, the Dalai Lama, some of you maybe have heard of that. That's not a name, by the way. That's a title for the individual who is the highest ranking monk in the Buddhist religion. He's called the Dalai Lama. He said this, he said, the purpose of our lives is to be happy. The purpose of our lives is to be happy. Eleanor Roosevelt, who was the first lady and wife of four-term president Franklin Delano Roosevelt, she said the purpose of life is to live it, to taste experience to the utmost, to reach out eagerly and without fear for newer and richer experiences. So the world today has a philosophy about the purpose of life. But you know, if you're a born-again believer, you are to live your life with a purpose that is centered around your Savior, Jesus Christ. Your life's purpose is to center around Jesus Christ and what His will is for your life. Listen, your purpose in life today is not to live a self-gratifying, happy life. That's not really the purpose of your life. We know that happiness is a fleeting thing. Happiness is something that's based on all the circumstances and situations falling out right. Very rarely does that ever happen. Life's purpose is not about self-gratification. It's not about being happy in life. It's not about all the experiences you can experience of what the world has for you. It's to be centered around Jesus Christ and His will for your life. When I got saved, I was saved from an eternity in hell. We need to not ever forget that. That without Jesus Christ, men and women today are on a path that will lead them straight to an eternity where they'll be separated from God. They're going to a place the Bible calls a place of torment. Ultimately, it will be what is known as the lake of fire. Men will be there suffering forever and forever. They'll be isolated and alone, and yet they'll be with a great multitude. 
There'll be no relief. There'll be no su- uh, break from their suffering. Uh, they're going to be crying out for someone just to, uh, to, to drop a drop of water on their tongue, and yet there'll be no relief. And it's amazing thing to think that God's going to give every born-again believer a brand new body in which we're going to live forever in eternity, one that never gets sick, never grows old, never suffers anymore. There'll be no sin in that place called heaven. I'm going to have an incorruptible, immortal, perfect body that I can live in forever. No aches, no pains, nothing else is ever going to touch it again. But God is equally able uh, to be sure that lost men uh, have a body that is going to be able to endure the torment of hell forever and die forever and never be consumed. And that's what God saved me from when He saved me. He saved me from that place called hell. Listen, today people look at getting saved like they're looking at some kind of business option, like they're checking off a box on, the, uh, on, the, uh, on, the, on, the, on their insurance plan. Well, what, do I want to check that box or not? And, and people are wondering about it, whether it's, you know, is it right for me? To, is it going to fit my lifestyle? And, you know, they're looking at being saved and trusting Christ. And, and may God help us uh, as the people of God not to forget we need to preach and teach that men without Christ are already as good as in hell. Their life today uh, is in jeopardy. Their souls are hanging in the balance. They must get saved. They must be saved. It's not a matter of whether I want that in my life now or not. Men must get saved. And when God saved me, He saved me from hell. He saved me from torment in the lake of fire forever and ever. And I can tell you what, that's a pretty good thing, isn't it? I'm never going to suffer one moment or experience it for one moment. God gave me eternal life. That means I'll never have to taste death or hell. I'm going to be able to live and be with the Lord. Death means to be separated from. And I'll never be separated from my Savior again. He lives in me right now. And as soon as I draw my last breath in this world, I'll be in His presence. There'll not be one step that I'm alone or by myself. He's going to be with me all the way. And I'm thankful for that. But you know what? Even better is that I now have a purpose for life. I have reason. I have, I have now, I have a, in my life, in this world, right now, an eternal purpose. And then if I live my life on purpose for Jesus Christ, it will have mattered that I lived a million years from now. It, it will have mattered. In our Sunday school lesson this morning, we're looking at Samuel. The Bible says in 1 Samuel 25, verse 1, and Samuel died. Samuel died. He lived his life. We we see his mother as a godly woman who realized her son was a gift of God. She gave her son back to God for God's will and purpose and wanted the will and purpose of God. She trained her child to hear the voice of God, to respond in respect and obedience and and to be ready for when God spoke to him and called him and, and began to use him. And then God used him as a judge, as a prophet, as a, as a, as a priest, as a, as, a, as a leader of men. His life made a difference. And then he died. And that's going to happen to all of us, isn't it? Someday, if the Lord doesn't come in our lifetime, it's going to be said of all of us, and he died. But then what, what will matter then is what was written on the pages of life. What we wrote on those pages by how and what we lived our life for, will it have mattered? Will it make a difference? You know, as a child of God, as a child of God, my life's purpose is the same as every other child of God. If you're here today and say, by the grace of God, our purpose is to live so that ultimately God is glorified. He deserves to be glorified. He deserves to be lifted up. He deserves to be presented, portrayed, and recognized by this world as the true and living God. And we know that our life's purpose is to live so that He's glorified. Our life's purpose is to continually grow spiritually in our relationship with Jesus Christ so that we become more and more like He is, so that He can, through our life, touch the lives of other people. Uh, Our our purpose is is to go with the gospel personally 
uh, and collectively in a local church to get the gospel to those who have not heard it. They've not heard of the grace of God, the love of Jesus Christ, the gospel of Christ. Uh, they, they, need to, they need to be made aware of that, uh, so that so that they can trust Christ and be saved. Our lives have the purpose of making a difference. And I, I shared our Sunday school class this morning. If you go back to Jude, chapter uh, Jude, there's only uh, 25 verses in the, in the book. But if you read verses 20 through 25, he said that our lives are to make a difference. Have compassion making a difference. And then he links making a difference with reaching the lost. He said that we're to pull the lost out of the fire, pulling them out so that they are saved, leading them to Jesus Christ. The difference we make in life, the purpose of our life, is to help other people come to know Jesus Christ. And so whoever you are today, if you're saved by the grace of God, we share the same common purpose. In our text, we see Jesus Christ share with us truth about our purpose as the people of God. In our text today, if you read before and, and kind of get the, uh, the situation that's happening here, the Lord just shortly ago had been baptized by John down in the Jordan River. He did it as an example for every born-again believer to do. And then we see that, uh, that then immediately he was led into the wilderness by the Spirit of God where, uh, where he, was, uh, he was tempted. And in the wilderness, he, he shows us that we can have victory over the temptations of the world, the flesh, and the devil. We can have victory over those temptations. And that victory comes through obedience to God's Word. That's how He won the victory. And we can win the victory the same way. And now He's come out of the wilderness and He's come down to the Sea of Galilee to the region around the Sea of Galilee. He comes here now as the Savior. John pointed him out, the Baptist. He's the Lamb of God who's come to take away the sin of the world. Before this time, he was Joseph's son, the carpenter's son in Nazareth. But now he's being presented as the Savior. The souls of men are saved as Jesus Christ begins to, uh, to minister to them and their sin debt uh, that was standing against them that they could never pay is being forgiven. And men begin to have a real relationship with God that they knew about mentally, but now they have a real relationship with Him personally by faith in Jesus Christ. And by the way, it's the only way any man can have a relationship with God, isn't it? It's through Jesus Christ. Otherwise, everything we know about God is just mental knowledge, but it's not personal and experiential. Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life, and no man cometh to the Father but by me. And so now men are having, now that men are coming and they're knowing God through Christ, and he speaks to men here in our text, men that are saved, saved men. He speaks to them about the purpose of their life. He, he speaks to them that, uh, about what, what they will live their lives for and what will have mattered in the end. And we see here that he calls out to men and he's speaking to save men. To see, he's calling to them to see they have a purpose and then to pursue it with their life. Let me ask you a question again. Do you realize your purpose this morning as a born-again believer? Are you pursuing your purpose? It is, it a, is it a part of your entire life or only a part of it? You know, how can we know our purpose and how can we see it become reality in 2018? Our purpose is to glorify, to grow, to go and make a difference in the lives of others. How can we, how can we know it and see it and become a reality? Well, let me give you these three things very simply. Write down number one through the preaching and teaching of God's Word. Through the preaching and teaching of God's Word, we will see our purpose and we'll see how it can become reality. In verse number 17, the Bible said, From that time, Jesus began to preach. He began to preach. You know, there have been many times throughout my saved life that God has shown me His will. He's clarified His purpose for my life through the preaching of God's Word. I didn't always stand here. There was a time I sat where you sit. I was saved. I knew the Lord as my Savior. I'd follow the Lord in believer's baptism. 
But I was like a lot of people. I didn't know what the purpose of my life was. I was looking for it. I was looking for it in work. I was looking for it in careers, in jobs, in hobbies, in houses, in things. I was looking for my purpose in life. I was looking for it in education, in all different ways. I was searching. And I can't tell you how many times in services, sitting where you sit, God spoke to me through his word. And there's been times, time after time, I remember I slipped out of a seat and came and found a place and said, Lord, if that's your will, I desire that with all of my life. You lead me. You guide me. Your will be done. Show me, God, what your will and plan is for my life. I don't know how many times I can look back over my life and I can, I can say that through the clear, spirit-led teaching of God's word, God spoke to my life about purpose. He clarified for me some things about living my life and how to live my life. And, and through the reading of the Bible, through the studying of the scriptures, through the searching of the word of God, God gave me clarity. God spoke to my heart. You know, in whatever area of my life it may have been in, maybe it was in my home about my relationship as a husband or later as a father, uh, or my relationship at that time with the people that I work with, maybe the, the people that uh, work where I work, whatever that relationship may have been, as a child of God, maybe in my church and what my purpose was within that church, God will speak to you and God will show you his purposes for your life through his word. You know, we see in our text here that Christ is preaching. The Bible said he, he began, he began at that time to preach. He began to preach. And, and we see how he preached. We see how he preached. And we see what his purpose was in preaching. You notice here what the Bible says that he preached. He, he preached a very simple message, repent, repent. That's a total thought within itself. That's a whole message, repent. And then he reminded them, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. He is the kingdom of heaven. And we have entrance into that kingdom through faith in Jesus Christ. He was at hand. He was present. The time was now. And so he preached a message of repentance and he preached a message of the importance of the moment. And, uh, and, and that's the message that he preached. And he spoke to these men about their purpose. The word repent, most of you probably have this defined in your Bible, but if you want to write right there in the margin of your Bible, the word repent means to have a change of mind that results in a change of direction in your life. It's a change of mind that brings about a change of direction in your life. It, it is the idea of to turn from our way to His way. It's, a, it's the idea of, of turning from our will to His will. This is what the word repent means. When I was lost, I needed to repent and be saved. I was on my way to hell. I was lost in my sin. Uh, I, 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 I was... I was, I was outside of Christ. I, I was, uh, I was uh, uh, not, not under His, uh, grace, uh, under his, uh, his salvation. I needed to be saved. I was going in a way that was leading me away from God and into hell. And then I received Christ as my Savior. I realized I was a sinner. And I didn't deserve where I was going to because it took the price of Jesus Christ, the perfect Son of God, to pay my sin debt. Do you ever think about that? The Bible said the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And the Bible tells us we owe a debt, a debt that we cannot pay because of our sin. When someone does something for us, services are rendered, or we receive something uh, for uh, that, that has been given or done for us, we are indebted for that. We're indebted for that. You know what our sin debt is? It is that God gave you His Son, Jesus Christ, His perfect sinless Son, and He came and died for you. You can't ever pay that back. I can't pay it back. I'm a sinner. I'm unrighteous. I, 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 there's nothing good in me. And I've fallen short of the glory of God. And I owe him a debt. And the only way I could pay that debt back was to suffer forever in, in eternity without Christ. 
but he came and he gave me the gift of eternal life. And he marked my debt paid in full. And now when I was saved, I turned from that way. I turned from going toward hell and I returned and received Christ as my Savior and now I'm on my way to heaven. Now that I am saved, guess what? I still need to repent of some things at times. My salvation settled. I know where I'm going to spend eternity. I got saved and I have been given eternal, everlasting life. My sin debt was paid at one time, all of it for all time. I don't ever have to get saved again. Some of you are here today, you need to get saved the first time. The one time you need to be, that's what you need today. You need to turn from the thoughts of whatever it is uh, that, that you can wait or that it's not important. Whatever thoughts, whatever things are, are, are keeping you from trusting Christ, you need to turn from that to the Lord and get started in the right direction for your life by receiving Christ as your Savior. Because He's the only one that can change anything and He can change everything in your life. Turn to Him. But even after that I've been saved, there's still times I need to repent. I need to turn from some things that I've allowed into my life that's taking me away from the will and purpose of God for my life, or I need to turn back to some things that I've forsaken in my life that keep me on point for the purpose of God in my life. There will never be a time in this world where we don't need to do some honest repenting sometimes. We just, need to, we just need to change our mind about some things and turn back to God and go again the way that is the will of God for our life. And that's the message the Lord preached. Repent. Whether you're lost, whether you're saved, right now there's not a one of us that doesn't need to do some repenting about something in our lives. All of us do. And then we notice here that that, uh, that, that what he preached were the words of God, didn't he? You know, in my relationship with Jesus Christ, there must be continual repenting as God speaks to me and directs me and guides me and instructs me, and he does that through his word. He does that through his word. You can go to 2 Timothy chapter 3 and, and, and just mark verses 14 down through verse 17 and read those verses and reread them and read them over again. The message is that, that I'm going to begin to preach tonight. I've taken the title from 2 Timothy 3.14. We know that 2 Timothy 3.1, and you can see it right here on our, on our logo for the year, this know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. We're living in that day. And he tells us, down in 2 Timothy 3, verse 14, what we ought to do in the last days. We ought to continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them. We ought to continue on in the things that we have been given and taught and learned our truth for our lives from the Word of God. Keep on going in them. Don't turn away from them. Don't turn to something else. Keep on going in those things. And then he talks about the Bible there in verse 16, that it's given by God and it's profitable. It's profitable. And then he says in verse 17 that it's the Word of God that will equip us and show us our purpose and reason for life. All these things in the Word of God, it's profitable. It enables us to fulfill our purpose. Sometimes people remind the preacher that he preaches too long. You know, sometimes it's casual. I, I always enjoy it. Some days it's usually in conversation. You're just talking about something, and then randomly, boom, there's just some little statement gets slipped in there about, you know, how long it, you know, this or that or the other. And, and anyway, the in inference is given that the preacher just preaches way too long. You know, on and on and on and on and on. And, uh, uh, you know, for me, that's, that's sometimes interesting. The very thing we need and must have in our lives, and yet we're so unwilling to give very much time to it, is the Word of God, isn't it? I need it in my life. I need more time in it in my personal life. 
I need more time in it, you know, uh, being accountable to others for it. Uh, that, that I may be, you know, sharing and discipling and working with and learning with other people through the Word of God. And, and it's, it's funny that, you know, the very thing we need and must have in our lives and yet we're willing to give so little time to is God's Word. God's Word deserves and demands our time and attention. When God's Word is taught and preached under the Spirit of God's leadership, that's God speaking to me just the same as if He were standing here bodily speaking to me. And then what I hear now, I become accountable for. And, and if God is speaking and directing me, the Word of God, the thing I found out about it is, is it, it, it demands a response. And when the Lord Jesus preaches here, He makes a plea. He sets forth His will very clearly. Follow me. And that demanded a response, didn't it? A choice, a decision. And every time we have an invitation at the end of a service, Surely God has spoken to your heart. Surely there's some area in your life where God is speaking to you about it, and, and it deserves that, that we respond to that. And you don't have to always do it publicly. Sometimes you ought to do it publicly. But, but we, we deserve a response. Acts chapter 20, verse 18, Paul talks about his ministry while he was there in Ephesus, to the church at Ephesus. He said, and when they were come to him, he said unto them, Ye know from the first day that I came into Asia, after what manner I have been with you at all times and all seasons, serving the Lord with all humility of mine and with many tears and temptations, which befell me by the lying and weight of the Jews. And then Paul said, And how I kept back nothing that was profitable unto you. In other words, I preached to you every single thing God gave me, I gave it all to you. I didn't hold any of it back because... It was profitable to you. It was profitable to you. And God, Jesus Christ, preached to the people. And when he preached to the people, they had to respond. And the preaching he preached and the things he taught them and preached to them helped them to see clearly their calling, their purpose, and what their life was to be all about. And we see that here, the preaching. Through the preaching and teaching of God's Word, we can know and have clarified our purpose. Write down this, number two, through the pattern we find in Jesus Christ. Through the pattern we find in Jesus Christ. How can I find my purpose? How can I follow it? How can I be sure you know, that it's in my life? And by the way, it's not just for part of your life. The purpose of Jesus Christ for your life is not just on Sunday. It's not just Wednesday night. It's not just part of the time. It's, it's not just for here, but not when you're there. The purpose of your life in Christ is for all of your life. Every area, every aspect of it, wherever you are, every relationship. We can find it through the preaching and teaching of God's Word. He clarifies it for us, and then we can follow it through the pattern we find in Jesus Christ Himself. Notice what he says in verse 19. Uh, he's, he's preaching. He says in verse 19, He saith unto them, Follow me. Follow me. Jesus Christ is the pattern for every child of God's life. Whoever you are, if you're saved by the grace of God, we have a pattern. And His name is Jesus Christ. Every child of God is to pattern their life after Him. Now, I like to learn about other people, and I have a, a whole bookshelf. You know, you buy them and put them together this wide and that high. I don't know how many shelves are on it. It's all biographies, and it's all about the lives of great Christian people. And I use the word great in the sense that their lives were great lives because they yielded them fully to God. That's why their life was great. That's why they made a difference is because they knew their purpose. They yielded their life to God. I like to read about them and learn about their lives, but ultimately, you know what I find out? I learn that they followed the Lord, and that's what made their life make a difference. Notice what he said, follow me. You know, in Matthew 11, we like verses 28 and 29 where he said, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. And what did he say? 
learn of me. Learn of me. Follow me. Learn of me. Peter and John were saved men here. When the Lord came down here to the Sea of Galilee in Matthew 4, chronologically, they were already saved. They had already trusted Christ as their Savior. You go back and, and reconcile the Scripture here. We believe that a little earlier, Andrew had met the Lord Jesus through the preaching and ministering of John the Baptist. When he got saved, he went and found Peter. Andrew went and found his brother, Simon Peter, and brought him to the Lord. And then the Bible tells us not long after that, that James and John, these men one by one found Jesus Christ and they, 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 they became saved men. And, uh, and so we see here that Jesus Christ, these men were saved, but they did not yet understand that they were to follow the pattern of the life of Jesus Christ. They did not yet understand, and they had not yet grown to the point spiritually where they began to live their lives on purpose for the Lord. They were just living. They were working, making money, getting some food to get up the next day and go to work and make some money and get some food. They were just existing. They weren't yet living their lives on purpose. And so the Lord comes. And we know, uh, we know that Peter and John, these men, uh, they had met the Lord. They had spent some time with Him. And now Jesus Christ was calling unto them to follow Him. To follow Him. You know, if, if we are going to follow someone... We have to keep our eyes on them. That's a simple statement, isn't it? But there's a lot of truth there. When we were in Ireland a few years ago on our mission trip, uh, Ireland is a beautiful country, and, and if you get off the highways, you get on these little one-and-a-half lane roads, and uh, they're not big enough, and they drive the smallest vehicles on planet Earth over there. They're little old things, and they, they're just... And, and, and if you get out in the country... They have hedgerows, rows of hedges, just like you would have a row of boxwoods at your house, you know. The, the, the road's kind of banked up, and then they have these hedgerows. They do that because they don't have fences. They use hedges and things like that as natural fencing for the sheep and all that kind of stuff, and still the sheep get out in the middle of the road and that kind of thing, and you go around a curve, and there's, you know, a lamb chop out in the middle of the street, and you've got to stop. But... Uh, but you can't really see real well. You're just locked in, you know, and you're trying to drive. And, and the missionary, Brother Canavan, they're used to all that, you know. And, and on, the, on the major interstates, those people fly on those roads over there. And, and, and they had a car you could put, you know, some of us men here have big trucks, you know. And we could open our glove box and keep a spare car in there about the same size as what they had. They had a Yaris. Does anybody in here have a Yaris? Good. That's just this little tiny car. And uh, they, they were, we were following them on this. We were going to drive across Ireland, all the way across. We rented three vehicles. And I was driving one, and Drew was driving one, and Evan was driving one, full of people. We're flying across Ireland. We're following this Yaris, you know. And they left us in the dust. Now, we're uncomfortable driving on the wrong side of the road, on the wrong side of the car, shifting with the wrong foot, the wrong hand, all that's wrong. And it's rain, it rains in Ireland every day, okay, every day. So they, we lose them. And, uh, and then sometimes going around those little sharp, tiny roads, they would cut around a curve and be gone, and we just hoped that they kept going straight and didn't turn left or right. If you're going to really follow someone, you have to keep them in vision. You have to be following along close enough that you can see them. And if we want to follow Jesus Christ, that he's calling to us, save people. Yes, you're saved, but are you following me? Have you seen the purpose of your life? Are you, are you as it clarified to you, that you're to pattern your life after me? to look at me, to learn of me. And if we're going to follow him, we have to keep our eyes on him. You know, we see Jesus Christ today through his word. That's how we see him. We see his, we see his life. We see 
him in, his, in the Word of God. We can see his heart. We see his passion. We see his purpose. We must see him there. We must see him there every day. It's not enough just to see him once a few minutes on Sunday morning hoping the preacher don't talk about the Lord Jesus, my Savior, too long because i got other more important things to do. Okay? We have to see him more than just once. We need to see him every day. We need to examine him. We need to, uh, to, to, to look at him, behold him, meditate on him, take in that pattern and let it imprint our lives. Uh, we need to, uh, to, to see his life and to follow his pattern and obey his will and be following him in all things at all times. Following the pattern of his actions, the things he did, the things he kept himself from, following his thought life about how he thought about things, his view, have a biblical view, seeing the world through the Word of God and through the Lord, seeing his attitude toward things, following him, seeing our purpose. And in verse number 20, the Bible said, and they straightway left their nets and followed him. They straightway left their nets and followed him. We must leave our way and learn his way and follow his way because there's so many of us even God's people we're just trying to do this thing our way we're just trying to do it our way you know is that McDonald's slogan <coughs> have it your way that's Burger King isn't it that's the competition okay many of you don't know uh, Julia works at McDonald's and and uh, has a, a kind of a management position there she's been to Hamburger U that's a real thing and graduated there uh, but that's Burger King have it your way you know that's the way we want the Christian life have it our way and we want a little bit of God a little bit of Jesus and a little bit of church and that's and then we're going to figure this thing out the rest of the way our way okay no the Bible said they straightway left their nets and followed him they followed him Sometimes we need to leave our ways and we need to find his way and follow his way. There will, there will have to be some things left behind if we're to go on following the Lord and living our life on purpose. They had to leave those nets. Straightway, the Bible said, they left their nets and followed him. There'll be some things in our life we have to leave. And you know what? They're not always bad things. Sometimes they're good things. They're not immoral. They're not against the law. But they're just not really a part of our purpose. And if we're going to follow the Lord closely, we have to just leave them and go on. You know, there'll be things we have to leave behind. In James 4, verses 14 and 15, James writes about the brevity of life. What is your life? Even a vapor that appeareth for a little time and then vanisheth away. Our life in this world is so short. It's so brief. The older I get the more I realize how little left there is of it to, to, to put in the hand of God. And I look back and say, God, if I, if I have to leave today, I'm not sure I'm ready because I don't see how significant my life has been for you. I really don't believe that, God, if I had to leave today, that I would be happy that I've allowed you to use my life to do all that you could have and would have done if I would have just followed you more closely. And then we realize how little time we got left to get it right. Little time left we have to really let our life make a difference, to follow the Lord. He says in verse 15, For you ought to say, If the Lord will, we shall live and do this or that. What's James saying? Life's so short, we can't afford to waste a day of it. Every single day of our life, we need to find out the will of God for our life, our purpose, and live it with clarity, following the Lord as closely as we can. When we begin to live our lives with His purpose and when we begin to follow Him, we'll not be making our own plans, but we'll be finding and following His plan through the pattern He's left for us of His life in His Word. In John, 20, uh, John 10, verse 27, Jesus said, My sheep hear my voice. And I know them, and they follow me. They follow me. You know, have you heard him calling to you to give him your life, to follow him? Then that's exactly what we need to do. 
is this, to follow him. If I want to know life's purpose and I want my life to matter and make a difference and if I want to glorify God and I want to uh, follow the Lord closely and, 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 and then I'm going, to have to, I'm going to have to look at the preaching and teaching and I'm going to have to follow the pattern. And then thirdly, notice that through the power of surrendering your life to Jesus Christ, then you can realize the purpose he has for your life. The power of surrendering your life to Jesus Christ. Verse number 19 in Matthew 4, And he saith unto them, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. And the most important part about that all, of that verse in, in all of it, is that Jesus said, I will make you. I will make you. We look at the purpose, glorifying and growing and helping people come to know Christ. And we, we wonder, how's that going to happen? You know, we look at our resources. And if we're honest, we don't have much to bring to the table. But Jesus said, if you'll follow me, if you'll, if you'll find and obey through the word and follow the pattern, I have the power I have the power to make this reality in your life. I will make you. Jesus Christ is the power to make your life what it could never be without Him. We talk to people all the time who know they have needs in their life. They, they have needs in their, in their personal relationships. They have needs in their marriages. They have needs parenting. They have needs emotionally. They have needs every other way. And they want it all to be right. And they, you know, they, they're trying to get it right. And they want, they want all these things to get straightened out and sorted out in their life. And they know they need Jesus Christ. And being, they know they need to be saved. But they, they think they have to get all that other stuff sorted out and get it right first. And it's never going to work that way. Because we can't sort it out. We can't get it right. But Jesus Christ can. And the thing that we need the most is Him. We need a Savior. And once He comes to live inside your heart and life, He begins to go to work on your life from the inside out. And He'll begin to put in place and put right and sort out. He'll show you the way. Uh, he, he'll do all the things that we only wondered, how could that ever happen? And then you can look back in life after you've known him and followed him, and you'll say, and you can see all the things that he did that you don't know how they could have ever gotten done, but the Lord did it. Jesus Christ is the power to make your life what it could never be without him. Listen, God is not looking today for self-made men. All you men that are here today, you know, we pride ourselves on that a little bit sometimes, don't we? Look at me. I'm a self-made man. And I'm not talking about that in the sense of, you know, some men in business, uh, they started with nothing and just pulled themselves up by their bootstraps, hard work and diligence and good investing and creating, selling, or having a good product or service, and they've grown until they become uh, uh, something that, uh, you know, the, that w is looked to. As a, as a leading company, business, or product. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the idea that you, you spiritually, you serving God, you making a difference, you glorifying God, God is not looking for you to make that happen in your own life. He's not looking for you to be a self-made Christian. And God's, God's motto is, unlike the military, is not be all you can be. Because sometimes that's what we want to be. We're just settling for all we can be. God wants his people to surrender all to him. He wants you to surrender all you are to him. He wants you to have faith in him. He wants you to forsake all and follow him. And then he'll make your life have eternal purpose. He'll do it. Surrender. We can all do that. We can all be obedient. And we can all follow. Those are things we can do. And if we're willing to do that, he'll do all the other things. 
He'll do all the other things. I, I kept thinking about this hymn as I was studying this passage of Scripture, and I just want to leave you with a couple stanzas of it. It was written by a man named Cyrus Nussbaum. That's a great name, isn't it? Nussbaum. And uh, he, he, was a, he was a preacher, a lay preacher. He pastored for a little while, but more or less he was just a, a godly preacher who, who would fill in or preach whenever he had an opportunity. He was a servant of God. And he, he pastored for a little while in a, in a community that was really repressed. It was poor. Uh, he started with nothing, and it kept going down. That's a bad place to be, isn't it? And it wasn't for lack of effort or faith in God. He was a faithful man. And he was so discouraged, and he told his wife, I'm so discouraged, and, you know, I, I'm going to go. And he was a part of a denomination that had, uh, uh, had a board, and they selected preachers and put them in places, you know. It's that way even today. Some denominations, the church doesn't select the pastor led of God by the Holy Spirit. Their board sends them one. And they get stuck with whatever they get, you know. And we know that's not a biblical way to do that at all. But that was kind of what was going on. So when they met at the annual meeting, he went and nearly begged them, get me out of here, send me somewhere else, I'm dying here. And, uh, and they, they, they said, no, after much prayer, we, we believe you're the man that needs to be there. And uh, he, he became discouraged. He said, I think I'm just going to quit. I'm just going to walk away. And his wife kept encouraging him. So finally one day, he, he just gave it all to the Lord. He said, I want your will and I want your plan, but God, I can't do this. And he, and he sat down and he wrote these things. He, he wrote, would you live for Jesus and be always pure and good? Would you walk with him within the narrow road? Would you have him bear your burden, carry all your load? Let him have his way with you. Would you have him make you free and follow at his call? Would you know the peace that comes by giving all? Would you have him save you so that you need never fall? Let him have his way with thee. His power can make you what you ought to be. His blood can cleanse your heart and make you free. His love can fill your soul. And you will see it was best for him to have his way with thee. And that's exactly true for every single one of us. It's best just to let him have his way for us. And so many of us just never get there. Uh, we just won't let go of our way. And we need to surrender all to him. How about your purpose? What are you living for? Do you even know? And if you do know what you're living for and what's driving you and what you wake up thinking about and what you go to bed thinking about, even if you know it, Ask yourself the question, what will it all mean one moment after you leave this world and enter eternity? Do you know today and have clarity about the purpose the Lord has for your life? Do you realize today that, that he has a purpose for your life that will make a difference and mean something a million years from now? Maybe we need to just hit the reset button on purpose. Maybe there's some things we need to let go, repent of, turn away from, get back to, put back in leave out, whatever it may be. But we can know and have clarity through the preaching of God's word. We can know through the pattern Jesus Christ has left behind for us to follow. And his is the power that will make it all happen. So today, we just want to encourage you. God speaks to our hearts through his word. Just as the Lord Jesus spoke, and as he spoke to those men, and as he gave those men his clear will through his word, there's a, there's a point, there's a message, there's a truth here today in our lives. We must respond to that. We must respond to that in our own heart and life. What will you do? What will you do with what God has spoken to your heart about today? Let's bow our heads. We're going to pray together. In a moment, we're going to stand and we're going to give you an opportunity to just say yes to the Lord, just to surrender to Him, agree with Him, follow Him, look to Him. But maybe today you've come to church and never in your heart and life have you ever trusted Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. If you're here today without Jesus Christ as your Savior, you're lost in your trespasses and sins. And you owe to God a debt. God paid your sin debt. He gave His Son, Jesus Christ, for you. His Son is sinless. His Son is perfect. He came and became your sin he suffered at the hands of sinful men. He was separated from God the Father because of your sin. 
He had to shed his blood. And he gave his life. And you owe that debt back to God. And there's no way we can ever repay that debt. And our sin debt will separate us forever from God. Today, if you're here without Jesus Christ, you're as good today as in the lake of fire as you are sitting in your seat. And today, you can trust Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. It's not, it's not like choosing a, a package of coverage for your cell phone. It's not like looking at insurance benefits and picking the ones you want to pay for or not. The Bible said you must be saved. You must be. And if you're here today unsaved, you're lost already, separated from God. You'll spend an eternity today in a place of torment. You must get saved. Repent of your sin. Turn to Jesus Christ. Turn from your way. Turn from your plan. Turn from your schedule. Turn from your calendar of how you think things ought to go in your life and get saved today. Settle it today, now and forever. Right now as we, as we get ready to pray, I just want to encourage you. Maybe you're a young person here, a teenager, or maybe you're the oldest person in the building. But you know today you need to trust Christ and be saved. I want to encourage you. Why don't you let someone meet you right here in the front with a Bible. You can find some place private to go and they'll share you from God's Word how you can trust Jesus Christ. Why don't you come today and, and settle that. Get that settled in your heart and life. If you're here and you know the Lord is your Savior, what about your purpose? What are you living for? It'll be the thing that consumes your thoughts. It'll be the thing... It, it, it's the thing that you're saving for. It's the thing that, uh, that you can't do without, that you can't imagine not being a part of your life. It's that goal that you're looking for in the future for yourself, for your family. That's your purpose. But where's Jesus Christ in that? Is He leading you? Are you following Him? Do you have clarity on your purpose? Maybe today we just need to reset the button on that and say, Lord, I want to live for your purpose. I want, God, what you want for me. Your will will be the best. God, have your way with me. Would you be willing today just to come and say, take all I am and have, and Lord, you direct it, you lead me, and you guide me. Use it to make a difference. Use it to glorify you. Lord, we want to live with purpose. Maybe you just need to slip out of your seat and come today and say, Lord, that's what I want for my life. I want, I want your purpose. Whatever God's speaking to your heart about, it will be best if we agree. It will be best if we say yes, if we follow him. Lord, we pray today that you'll have your way in every heart, in every life. God, may we glorify you through obedience and faith and trust in your word and faith and trust in following you as you lead us. God, some folks today, you're speaking to their hearts about some very radical thoughts in their life. Things, Lord, that maybe they've never considered before. They never saw it on the radar of their life or in their hearts and lives and homes. You're talking to them about their time. You're talking to them about their treasure. You're talking to them about their talents and how they can invest those and use those about your purpose and, and Lord, what you have for their life. And so, Lord, we pray that, God, they'll just... Be, be faithful. They'll trust you. They'll believe your word. They'll trust the Spirit of God speaking to their heart. They'll move forward in obedience to you. Lord, someone here today needs to trust you as their Savior. We pray today they would just settle it. Just get it settled, Lord, so that their life can move forward and grow. God, you spoke to those men on the seashore that day. They were saved men. But God, they, they hadn't yet considered that you had a purpose for their life. And God, you have a purpose for our lives, not just part of the time, not just our way, but your way all the time. Lord, help us to desire it and to surrender to it. Your will be done. God, these things, God, will help us. They'll put our life where it ought to be so that we can live effectively for you this year. So you, you help us today, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to stand together. We're going to turn to hymn 310. We're going to sing a verse of that. But while we stand and it's easier for you to slip out of a seat, if you need to come and find a place to pray, you come as we sing the very first verse of hymn number 310. <clears throat> Sing 
the second verse, verse 2. Amen. Well, it's been good to be in church this morning, and it's been a pleasure to see everyone today. And we're thankful for the Word of God, and we're thankful for, uh, I'm just thankful that the Lord would allow me to have a purpose that has something to do with what He's doing, and uh, that uh, we can uh, glorify Him with our lives. So I'm praying the Lord will uh, continue to help us to be uh, uh, focused on Him, and Him to be the center of of what our life is all about. But we're thankful for that, and uh, I'm excited to be back tonight hear the word of God again. I hope you are as well, and uh, we're looking forward to it. Uh, we want to have a word of prayer as we finish today, uh, but we're uh, thankful for a great morning. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we are thankful again for the privilege to be in church today. Lord, for the, uh, the privilege to have your Bible, Lord, and we're thankful that, uh, Lord, you have a purpose for our life and that help us to be focused on your purpose, Lord, what you have for us, and help us to be centered on uh, the Lord Jesus Christ, and, and help us to uh, just, Lord, allow you to lead us and guide us uh, so that we can uh, be a part of the things that uh, you have planned. Uh, but we do love you today. Uh, we're thankful for our church. Pray you'd help us continue to grow and to uh, share your gospel with uh, our community, our friends, and, and our family, Lord. But we love you today. We thank you for uh, for Christ died on the cross for our sins so we can have salvation and know you. We love you and we thank you. It's in your precious name.